Hi, I'm Dave. <laughs> uh, I've been a uh, county recorder for Butterflies and Moss in Glamorgan for quite a while now. Uh, and today I'm basically going to talk about how you go about identifying uh, macro moths. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what macro moths are. Uh, I, in fact, we'll start off with, with what are moths, but that I'm not going to spend too long over. Uh, the basic sort of process by which you go about um, identifying them, which isn't that basic, I suppose, uh, but the main sort of thrust is to talk really about familiarising yourself with the, moth, with the moth families, and uh, and then I'll take you through some of the sort of the mysteries and the pitfalls. Um, when I timed myself doing this, um, it was it did go on for quite a while. So I have put in an intermission, um, which hopefully is roughly about sort of halfway through. So we're, we're around about sort of five, 45 minutes time or so. We'll have a five minute intermission uh, for a pit stop, um, and then we'll crack on with with the second half. But um, so yeah, so that's the sort of the, the structure. So what is a moth? Um, Wikipedia has lots of um, very sort of technical jargon uh, about what moths are. And if you want to read it, I suggest you go onto Wikipedia because I don't really have time for you to read it now. Uh, and there's lots of stuff that, I mean, I, I, the only one thing I would say um, is that the, I, I love the particular, in particular the line that most moths are nocturnal, crepuscular or diurnal. So basically, they could be at any time of the day. That's helpful. Uh, there's an awful lot of then stuff about Lepidoptera and um, how you determine them from other insects. But the main thing to take away from it is that, well, they're just fantastic insects and they've got scale, scales on their wings. That's the, the key take home message of what is a moth. The first question that anyone ever sort of asks you uh, when you say that you're, uh, you like moths or you do stuff with moths is what's the difference between butterflies and moths? And these are the usual sort of fallacies. Uh, butterflies fly during the day, moths fly at night, butterflies have club antennae, moths have feathery ones. Well, we've already ruled out the moths just fly at night from, from the Wikipedia definition. Uh, but so there's a day flying club antennae moth. Uh, so yeah, you can kind of forget about that. Oh, I should also point out some of these, uh, there's going to be a lot of photos in this presentation. Some of them will be credited, some of them won't, and that's partly down to the uh, appalling management of the Glamorgan Moth Group uh, photo archive, and I apologise now if anyone sees one of their photos and there's no credit associated with it. Uh, basically, I've been plagiarising everything I've got from um, uh, from the Glamorgan Moth Group archive. So if you do see any photos that's yours and is not credited, feel free to, to let me know and I'll make sure that, it, that it's properly archived in it for the future. Anyway, uh, the next fallacy about the difference between butterflies and moths. Moths uh, hold their wings flat across their bodies and butterflies sit with their uh, wings held above them. Yeah, clearly nonsense. Uh, that's definitely a moth. Um, okay, it's got feathery antennae, but you know, we're talking about posture here. So yeah, that's an early thorn, sitting like a butterfly, allegedly. And the final one is the um, the, the butterflies are pretty and, and moths are boring and brown. Well, there's a boring brown butterfly for you. Uh, and a rather attractive moth. So, so yeah, that's all just nonsense. So the difference is uh, there is no difference. They're all Lepidoptera. They're all uh, butterflies. Are just moths, in my opinion. And uh, I challenge any butterfly enthusiast to uh, to dispute it. I I treat it the same way as what's the difference between a ladybird and a beetle? Well, ladybirds are beetles, so they're just a group in amongst the grand order that is Lepidoptera. Uh, if you want to get technical, uh, the actual taxonomic difference between um, a butterfly and a moth is a thing called the frenellum. So it's a, a little spur that's on the, the, um, on the hind wing which links the two wings together. Moths, all moths have that and butterflies don't. Um, and if you ha are homeschooling or have small children in the house, don't do a Google image search for frenellum. Uh, it'll come up with some uh, well, basically, it's a term uh, that's used in uh, part, as part of the male anatomy. So uh, 
yeah, just just don't do that if there are small children in the in, uh, around. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be talking mainly about, well, entirely about macros uh, today. So um, I suppose the next thing to tackle is what's the difference between a macro moth and a micro moth. Um, so size, yeah, no, it's not not entirely. Uh, that is a mother of pearl, which is a, a, a pyrolid moth. Uh, it's definitely a micro, even though it's it's quite big with a wingspan of um, of about four centimeters, thirty five millimeters or so. And similarly, there is a very small macro moth. That's the Marshmallow Blard with a wingspan of less than two centimeters. So, on a one to one, um, size isn't the thing that makes um, makes the distinction. What it actually is, is kind of, it's almost a taxonomic split. Um, so when I was, when I started uh, mothing, uh, the, if you put the taxonomic order into a long line uh, like that, um, with the butterflies pretty much in the middle, the macro moths would be the, uh, the ones to the right and the micros are the ones uh, that are less evolved, if you like, with the sort of anomalous, honorary macros uh, with the swifts, the clear wings, and, uh, and the, uh, the other families there. Um, so that was kind of how it used to be. Um, so that's not really a very clear definition. So when writing his, uh, the, the, the micros book, Phil Sterling came up with this definition um, in that, so most if, if a family of moths contains mostly big species, then that would be considered a macro, a macro family. And if the family contains mostly small species, then that would be mostly micros, which is great as a definition, um, but doesn't really help you if you have a moth in front of you on its own. All you know is how big that moth is. You don't know who it's related to. So it is a useful definition but it doesn't really help you lot out there trying to tell whether your moth is a macro or a micro we'll come back to that in a bit but the key thing is that you really need to be getting familiar with the moth families and that's hopefully going to be the main sort of thrust of what we're going to talk about so just as a little bit of context so of the 2700 odd species of lep in the UK, about 100 um, butterflies. The rest are moths and it, there are considerably more micros than there are macros. There's about a thousand um, species of macro. Now given that I've only got a couple of hours to do this talk, I'm not going to be going through and, ident and teaching you how to identify all 1,000 um, species of macro moth that can be found in the UK. Um, all I can really justify doing is going through identifying the families and giving you some tips. So that's what we'll be doing. Um, when, so when I was growing up, this were, these were the families of uh, the, the, the macro moths that I became familiar with, with uh, the ones on the left being um, these sort of honorary macros, if you like, the ones that were in that um, less evolved than the butterflies section and the ones on the right are the what you might consider the taxonomically accurate um, macros so these are the, uh, the families that were more evolved but then we've realized uh, thanks to um, European um, research that actually we had the taxonomic order wrong and what we then found uh, and, and we had, we've, uh, the UK sort of lagged behind uh, Europe, but we finally uh, accepted their definitions um, when a, a new publish a new checklist was published in December 2013, and that moved things around a little bit. So the butterflies were no longer the sort of the the, the linchpin, and in, indeed, um, much hilarity was had amongst those of us who study micro moths to now turn to the butterfly people and say, well, you could have a strong argument to say that butterflies are not just moths, they're micro moths because they're less evolved than pyrolids. Um, as I say, much hilarity uh, was had uh, at that. So these are now the new families. Um, 
it does make things slightly simpler in that there are now less of these um, families um, in the sort of the, the post uh, butterfly section or post pyrolid section, I should say now. Uh, there's a couple new ones in amongst the, um, the, the honorary macros. Um, so that's what we're going to do anyway. We're going to go through these families and, and, uh, and try and give you some sort of idea as to how you might become familiar with them. Because let's be fair, there's quite a lot of, of moths. Um, all different sizes, all different shapes, all different colours. And so when you come to a moth trap and or, or come across a moth, where do you start? And that's really the point of this talk. So where do I start? If I catch, uh, if, I, if I see a moth like that, bearing in mind that I've been trapping for 40 years now, I know I don't look that old, um, the first thing I see when I see that moth is, well, it's a broken barred carpet, and I don't have to actually think about how I know that it's a broken barred carpet, I just kind of know. And that's not very helpful to, in terms of giving other people that knowledge. How do I turn around to say to someone, well, how do you know that's a broken barred carpet? It's like, well, I just, just, just do. Similarly, is an orange swift. And, and what makes it an orange swift? Well, it's um, clearly a swift moth and it's kind of orange and that's, really all there is to it surely so yeah that, that, that as I say that's the kind of process that goes through my head and I just thought well that's not very helpful in terms of teaching people how to identify so I thought well let's 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 put it into let's try and create a flow a flow chart and this is what my process is so when I see a moth is it one that I instantly recognize? And in the case of those previous two, it was something that I instantly recognize. So yes, I know what it is. But each time you come across something that you think you know what it is, it's always worth checking uh, in the books. And I'll talk a little bit in a, in a shortly about what that entails in terms of checking what the books say. And, but do the books confirm what you say? Yes, they do, fantastic you have your identification. It's as, it's as simple as that. If you don't instantly know what it is, uh, do you recognize the group? Do you recognize the family? And as I mentioned before, this is kind of the thrust that I'm sort of working towards in terms of uh, um, becoming familiar with, with the groups of moths. So yes, I think I know what the group is. So you look through the, look through the books, through the related species, and see if you can work out which one it is. And this is where you'd come to if the books gave you information that implied that you were wrong in your original idea. Um, so you look through the related species until you find something that fits. And at that point, great, you then go back and you recheck the books at that point to see whether that actually fits. And if it doesn't, you go round and round and round in a helpless loop until eventually you either give up um, or, uh, you come out with your identification. Now, if you didn't recognize even the group, you've got a moth, you've got, got absolutely no, where, no idea where to start. What do you do then? Well, you kind of have to go through the whole book uh, or you just email somebody else and see uh, if they can come up with an answer for you uh, or at least point you in the right direction. Uh, so hopefully that's a sort of, there, there you go, that's, that's all you need to know. That's, that's how you identify a moth. Um, no, I'm joking. So when you start out, there will be certain moths that you instantly recognize. Um, and as you get more experienced, that number of species that you instantly recognize will increase. So when you start out, most people would recognize um, a buff tip here um, fairly quickly. It's one of those uh, species that is fairly iconic, uh, you know, the, the, the snapped birch twig. 
you'd, you'd know that and you wouldn't need to spend any time thinking about it right. until someone decides that there's two species and then you've got to dissect the pesky things. But that hasn't happened yet with uh, buff tip, so we can happily accept that. Angle shades, similarly, um, once you've learned the, the fact that you have this distinctive shape at rest with the crumpled wings and the slight and the sort of pinkish thing, it's one you just know and you'll not have to worry about checking in the books. And as I say, I've, I've been trapping for 40 odd years and nowadays there isn't much that comes to my moth trap that I have to stop and think what it is. Um, I did catch something this morning that made me sort of stop and, and think and then I saw another one I thought oh no I do know what that is and that was it so um, out of whatever it was 25 species in the moth trap today there was nothing in there that I couldn't just recognize straight away without looking at the books as I say I can't give you 40 years of experience of moth trapping all I can do is try and sort of nudge you in the directions of, of how to make that learning curve a little bit easier so that's if you if it's something you know but you still need to check the books. So, or at least for some species, you will still need to be checking the books. And what, what sort of things do I mean when, when we're checking the books? Well, are there similar species to the thing that you think it is? Uh, most of the textbooks will give you um, some indication of things to look for within those species uh, as to how you would differentiate between them. And we'll have a look at that in a second. Uh, flight period is a potentially useful piece of information, but it's worth bearing in mind that um, the changes in, in climate mean that things fly at funny times of year. Um, so I, I remember a few years ago, uh, Dave Beveridge in Caerphilly had um, a knot grass come to his window in the deep snow in December, which is completely outside of um, any sensible flight period or any sensible weather for um, a moth that should be on the wing from, from May onwards. So flight period can be useful, but it's not, not very reliable. Nevertheless, it can give you an indication. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's worth bearing it in mind, just don't take it as gospel. Habitat, again, can be useful if you're, say, on flat home, picking a random um, habitat or a random location. Because um, I know I think there might be some flat home people here. Uh, uh, that's obviously, it's a, it's a lump of limestone um, in the middle of the English Channel, uh, uh, not the English Channel, the Bristol Channel. Um, and the habitat there is, is, is limestone and it's very different from what you would get elsewhere. So the kinds of things you'd get there would, you would expect um, would be different. So things that I wouldn't expect to catch in my garden near Lantricent, yeah, quite reasonable to find it somewhere like Flatholm. Whereas, and uh, but again, the, the part of the problem um, with worrying too much about habitat would be these things move around. They, they can fly quite considerable distances and so it can only really be an indication. So it's worth bearing in mind, but don't rule things out purely on the basis of habitat. Just bear it in mind. Probably more important is, is, is the food plant nearby, but again, they can be mobile. So a one-off, could be miles away from its nearest food plant. Whereas, um, but if you've caught a dozen um, in your moth trap happens to be underneath um, uh, a willow, for example, say you've caught a, a kitten, uh, one, of the, one of the three kitten moths, you're underneath um, a salix, you've got 20 kittens, they're probably all sallow kitten. Um, obviously, there could be an alder not, there, not very far away, but, um, that kind of thing can be useful. Similarly, um, things like um, lead coloured drab, which feeds on aspen. If there's no aspen anywhere near you and you're catching lots of what you think are lead coloured drab, then it's probably worth checking them to make sure that they're not just oddly coloured um, clouded drabs. Possibly more important is, is it found in your area? Again, the odd anomalous uh, one or two, um, 
yeah, you can't really necessarily rely on them. But never, but again, if you're catching a lot of them and it's not known from that area, then it's worth getting it double checked. I've banged on about my age quite a bit already. Um, when I started out, uh, we were relying on um, Richard South's amazing um, two volume set, uh, fantastic books. Um, but if you want to flick through the pictures because you didn't know where to start, the picture, the plates are all interspersed uh, within the text. So it could take quite a long time. And if you didn't find it in the first volume, you've then got to go to the second volume and flick through that. And if you were looking at micros, you were relying on Merrick, which is, um, the, well, there are no pictures. It's, it's all text. It's all um, with, with, with the odd line drawing of uh, wing venation. And that's all you've got to go on. Uh, all entirely key based. It's quite tough, and it was quite tough um, back in the day. Where, so in 1986, I think it, 85, I think it was, um, that Bernard Skinner's color identification guide came out. Um, it kind of revolutionized things. The Moths and Butterflies of Great Britain and Ireland series had been sort of chugging along for a bit, but this was the first book that really put all of the macro moths um, in one easy volume and all of the plates are at the end. So you only need to flick through um, the last sort of 50 odd pages um, to, to find out what you want. And when it was uh, reprinted in 96, it got another sort of wave of people interested. But by the time the sort of the most recent version um, came out, things had probably moved on a bit and people weren't really um, embracing the idea of looking at set specimens. That's why I grew up looking at set specimen, plates of set specimens, but these days uh, people prefer um, something more natural and that's where these books really um, come to the fore. So um, Waring Townsend and Lewington probably, you know, again, it revolutionized um, identification because suddenly you weren't relying on uh, looking at, at moths in odd poses that don't really make sense. You're looking at the moths as you were finding them in the moth trap. And I would go so far as to say that um, Chris Manley's book uh, is even more impressive, not least because it contains almost all of the species of micros as well as um, most of the macros. So it's a, you know, a fantastic photographic guide and I can't really recommend it enough. Uh, do have to bear in mind that you, know, you are only um, looking at one or two examples of these things, but nevertheless, it's uh, a very impressive book. On top of that, you've also got websites um, and there's vast resources of, um, for identifying things. And if you're stuck, um, then flicking through from one species to the next on somewhere like UK Moths is actually quite a useful way of trying to work out where to get to in terms of um, getting, getting to the group um, or family of the moth that you're, you're trying to identify. Uh, and I, indeed, when I was given European photos of moths to, to identify, I would use the European equivalent of this and just flick through until I got somewhere close. And then you can work out whether or not uh, that species is ad accurate or not. Uh, another website that I, I really enjoy as well, actually, is this one, which, which people may not have come across, uh, run by a chap called Chris Lewis. Um, and it's got quite it's quite comprehensive um and it's done something that i've always liked uh, and always wanted to do so for each species account uh they have um within it uh he puts the uh the key characters and the similar species and he also includes um uh Full dissections, and I don't mean just of the of the genitalia, which are uh, used in um, for identifying some critical species. He actually dissects the the entire moth out, so you've got the forewings and the hindwings and the and the antennae um, for for some species, and it's, it gives you all of the characters that you could potentially need. Um, <clears throat> And it's a it, it's a really useful um, really useful website, and I've used quite a, a few of his images here uh, with his permission. Um, so yeah, I can't, I can't recommend that one highly enough, but you do have to know your way around because you need to know the families realistically in order to be able to get to your determination. So, but it, if you know, your know what you think it is, it's a good place to go. 
And of course, the other thing to um, bear in mind is the local knowledge. Now, I don't know how many of um, the participants today are from Glamorgan, my patch, um, but there are other me other websites out there for various parts of, of Wales and the rest of the UK. Um, but this is um, really the sort of the, the, the go to uh, website, I would say now, if you're moth trapping in, in Glamorgan, uh, in order to, to see where the things, uh, whether the thing that you uh, think you've got is um, found locally. Uh, and, then, and of course, there is also um, representing the, the well. Local environmental record, there is also a Darien, which is uh, uh, has all um, uh, found an animal available uh, for your distribution maps. Um, but yeah, so somewhere like whatever local group, moth group you have, um, if they haven't got a website, uh, there'll be a county recorder who would know whether or not uh, a species was um, found in their area. So, how do you identify a moth? Do you know the family? Um, if you don't know it straight off, um, can you work it out from the group? So, there are around about 300 geometrids. There are 400 noctuids and about a hundred uh, in the family. And realistically, getting to know those families is the key to getting your identification. Uh, and that's, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's quite important. Bearing in mind that sometimes you'll have these things that look like it's a carpet so you have to become familiar with so I mean it, this is a, a flat triangular looking moth must be a carpet right well no it's not a fat it's not uh, it's a fan foot which is in the Arebidae this sort of new family but once you've recognized um, that this is um, a fan foot then you're home and dry surely well yeah, almost, uh, because this one here is actually a micro. This is um, very similar markings, hasn't got the, 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 the subterminal line, uh, and the antennae are sort of tucked across, uh, sort of held, swept back across the back. So again, you kind of need to recognize the family, or you recognize the species, and then you work from the family. It's yeah, it's a bit of a circular sort of argument, chicken and egg kind of situation. Um, but yeah, so you need to get to know the families. Right, let's talk a bit about morphology. Um, and I'm going to, there's some terminology that I'll be using uh, during the sort of the, the, the next section of the, the talk. So um, moths are insects. They have three sections to the body, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Uh, all of which, uh, well, these are less useful in terms of providing characters um, for macros and the head in particular, the things like the palps, we don't really use them much in uh, recognizing the, the macros, but that becomes more important when um, in next week's course when I start talking about micros. The wings obviously have most of the, carry most of the market and that's what most of the stuff that we'll be using uh, in identification and there are other characters potentially on legs and we're not going into uh, genitalia today. Uh, in terms of wing markings, um, I don't tend to like the sort of the, the, the dumbed down version. I, I learned these terms and I apologize. Uh, do I apologize for using them? No, I don't know that I'm, I'm that apologetic for using technical terms um, because I think that they provide clarity if you know what I'm talking about. So um, in terms of corners of the, of the wing, apex is the, the, the top corner, the tornus is the bottom corner of the forewing, and then the anal angle we don't really use very often um, is the sort of the, the, the bottom corner of the of the hind wing. But the apex and the tornus are the two um, corners that are useful to, to remember. 
Um, so in terms of the, the edges of the wing, the costa is uh, what some people refer to as the, the leading edge, the dorsum is what some people will refer to as the trailing edge, and the termin is the other one, which I haven't heard a good sort of um, explanation as to or, or dumbed down version if you like of, of what the, the term means it's a, it's it's the, the the part of the wing that is furthest from the body it's if you think of it as a triangle so it yeah the, the, those are the three and I do use those terms quite a lot uh, in terms of noctuids in particular um, there are three sort of stigma or, or, or marks the, the reniform stigma is what Waring and Co call the kidney mark the orbicular stigma, I can't, I can't remember what they call it, um, and the claviform stigma is the uh, the dart. So in something like the heart and dart, the heart is the reniform stigma, the dart and the orbicular stigma is the other one. Nearly there, uh, a pickle spot, it's a spot near the apex, a tornal spot is a spot near the tornus, and then discal spots, this is the, the, the discal area of the wing is this um, section um, where if you're looking at the venation where, the, where this is what's called the cell um, the, sorry the discal cell uh, which is more obvious if there are no vein, uh, no scales on so if you took all the scales off and you just had the veins then you'd see this uh, discal cell and the discal spot is in that area and similarly for the hind wing. So discal spots can be quite useful. Uh, in terms of lines, if you think of the middle as being the median line, uh, post-median would be after the median, anti-median is before the median, and then if it's near the base, it's a basal line, if it's near the edge, it's a subterminal line. So just before the termin is a terminal line. Subterminal line, sorry. Terminal line would be one that was actually along the termin. So there's some technical stuff. Um, uh, I'm not really going to dwell on this slide. So if we if we needed to go into venation, and we will look at venation briefly um, in a bit, um, then we'd be this. This is the kind of thing. This is actually um, taken from Merrick. This is the kind of thing that. Um, that Merrick used to deal with quite a lot. It's a bit of a uh, peculiar um, means of identifying a moth is to take all the scales off first, then you can work out what the family is. And you've got no scales left to work out what the rest of it is. But nevertheless, that was um, quite a popular pastime in, in olden days. So going back to, we're, we're checking the books. Um, let's have a look at two similar species. So if you caught uh, one of these two, uh, we have uh, Lichness and Campion. And in Waring Townsend and Lewington, um, the first thing they say is on a fresh Campion, you get a pink flush. And you can see on this individual, there is a slight pinkish flush. The problem with that is that the pink fades. So after um, a week or two, you've lost that pink and then you'll back down to just the basic markings. Uh, so what else do they say? They say, they also say that the, the, the campion is slimmer in body and broader in forewing. Well, I'm sorry, I can't see what's slimmer about um, campion in, in the body. I guess if, if the wings weren't there, we might see that it was the abdomen they were talking about, but I'm not sure. Uh, broader in the forewing, yeah, I can kind of see that it is slightly broader. But the problem with that is that it's a comparative um, description. So you kind of need both in order to be able to, um, to say which is slimmer, which is broader. So that's not that helpful um, personally. Uh, what else do they say? Reniform and orbicular stigma are usually joined. They don't use those words, those are my words. So the reniform uh, is the kidney mark and the orbicular, the circular one. Uh, usually joined in the campion. Well, it kind of is in that, not very clearly um, and kind of isn't there, although not very clearly because it's a bit worn. So that's not great, but it's potentially useful. Uh, the one I really like though, um, and I'm glad that they do actually mention it, uh, is the way that the subterminal line, um, where it meets the dorsum, so on the campion, you get this sort of square effect um, 
which on the Lichtness is more rounded. Uh, it's a semicircle. And that's really the character that I look for um, when doing this. Now, incidentally, um, I, just to sh keep it bang up to date, um, I was doing some verification work this morning uh, whilst I was waiting to, to join, whilst my internet was stable. And I saw this photo come up uh, from Flatholm and it was entered as Lichness. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Oh, hang on a minute. What's going on here? It's not a Lichness. It's clearly separated uh, reniform and uh, orbicular stigmas. No sign of pink. It's in reasonably good condition, but that is wrong. And I wasn't going to mention tawny shears in this talk, but that's what this moth is. It's a similar species, um, which isn't directly um, mentioned when comparing Lichness and Campion, but clearly it's a confusion species because, you know, it is quite similar. Uh, but yeah, so it doesn't, looking at the, the edge of this wing, it's got this sort of zigzag effect. Um, it's not even square, it's more, more a, um, a V or a W. So yeah, not, not Lichness as uh, the recorders um, suggested it's actually tawny shears so i'm quite pleased that they put that in yesterday for me to um, include in today's talk uh another i'm, I'm not going to be doing this for for every uh, confusion species by the way because we really would be here all day uh, or in fact all week um but another pair that is useful to to briefly uh use as an example are uh, the peacock moths. So this is the peacock, this is sharp angled peacock. And um, in Waring, Townsend and Lewington, this is what they have to say. The paw print mark, uh, 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 hang on, sorry. The, the paw print mark and dark aged concavity in the leading edge of the outer edge of the whitish gray brown speckled forewing and strongly pointed hindwing readily distinguish this moth from all but the shimmer, similar sharp angled peacock. Right, okay, so basically you can't mistake it for anything else if you've got one of these two species. Fine. Uh, so they're pretty much unmistakable. Under sharp angled uh, peacock then, they say often confused with the peacock. Yeah? Usually has the distinct gray cross band uh, running all the way through the paw print and across down through the hind wing. Yeah, okay, I can see that. That makes sense. Uh, sometimes obscured in darker specimens. Okay, fine. Concavity includes fringes. Uh, in, sorry, concavity including fringes is very dark blackish as opposed to dark brown in the peacock. Okay, so it's another comparative one. That's supposedly dark brown, that's supposedly blackish. Well, I'm not, not sure about that particular character. Uh, the paw print is smaller and less well formed. Okay, yeah, but again, that's comparative. Tricky if you've only got the one. Uh, and and I love this, uh, the brown blotch on the leading edge, uh, so this, what I would call a sub apical spot in rather more precision, uh, is often narrow and more tapered. Okay, uh, I can't see any actual difference between these. So, uh, and finally, they talk about the, the line, the terminal line of the hind wing is uh, dotted and more broken on sharp angled and almost intact on peacock. Well, that's a bit sort of tenuous, but I'll let them have it. But yeah, I mean, just to say, growing up, we only ever caught sharp angled peacock Every, uh, in Somerset. That was that was the species we got. We never, ever, ever saw that. They all look the same. And so if I see a sharp angled peacock, I just instantly know that's a sharp angled peacock. When you act, when you finally see the peacock, it does look different. It has a, it just feels different. And it's probably mainly down to this sort of gray brown, uh, gray band down it. Um, so that's the sort of, that's the, the similar species that wearing an, Townsend and Lewington refer to. But the other piece of the puzzle 
example that I alluded to is is the local information. So what's the what's the distribution of those locally? So if you look at the uh, the moths of Glamorgan, um, we do actually include peacock moth records with the proviso that um, we believe that there's an awful lot of misidentification going on and subsequent to asking for evidence of peacock moth um, by way of uh, photographs we had no further records they, they so um, we then struck out all of the the records from um, from history and when I was adding this slide into the presentation yesterday I noticed that we've got one record and when I looked at it it's like oh uh, yeah I remember that um, somebody entered um, a record of the peacock butterfly as the peacock moth so it's um, one I need to weed out of the database I thought I had weeded it out but clearly it's still in there so looking at that in Glamorgan if you catch a peacock moth then you need to send me a photograph because we don't have any confirmed records of peacock moth anymore in the database because I've um, expunged them all and similarly um, in the rest of Wales uh, there aren't actually very many records in the whole of Wales. So um, very much a species that if you find it in Wales, uh, your county recorder would be very interested in confirmation uh, because yeah, generally speaking, it's not really found here. Just because it's not found here doesn't mean it doesn't occur here, but it does mean that county recorders would like more information to confirm it. Okay, so that's kind of the um, a little bit about how we get to where we're going. Um, so let's have a look at the macro families because this is really the nuts and bolts of how you identify a species is is getting to know the groups. Uh, I'm going to try and whiz through the first few of these. So, for example, the swifts. What makes it a swift? Well, they're very primitive. They 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 look a bit sort of odd. Um, they all sit very sort of um, uh, tentiform uh, sort of with their wings sort of folded um, roof-like across the back. Uh, there are five, only five species to remember, uh, one of which is one of those you catch it, once you've identified it, you will just know it. Male and female um, ghost moths are really distinctive, not really a problem identifying them. Um, nothing really like them. Then there are the two relatively similar species, the uh, common swift and orange swift. Common is, um, is, a, is a spring species really and uh, orange swift is an autumn species so you can kind of work it out vaguely on flight periods um, with the proviso that flight periods aren't necessarily reliable. And then the other two species are a little bit more um, specialized with the map wing swift being a, an upland species and gold swift being actually quite scarce. Um, and the key there is that it's got parallel um, cross lines rather than uh, V-shaped cross lines. Uh, the next sort of family along, the Cotidae, there's uh, only three species. They are again two that once you've come across them you'll just know them. Um, goat moth, leopard moth, and if you think you've got caught reed leopard, uh, then your county recorder would definitely want to know about that because it's not currently known from Wales. Again, doesn't mean you're wrong, just means we would really like to see a photo or some kind of evidence to, to um, make sure. Rather, it's probably it was just a wainscot, one of the wainscots, but nevertheless, you never know. It, there could it could be hiding in the fens somewhere um, of South Wales or or elsewhere. Uh, the next macro family, the, the clear wings, nothing really you can mistake a clear wing for within the moth world. Obviously, you could confuse them for, for wasps. There's about, you know, 20 odd species and um, yeah, pretty unmistakable and a, and a fantastic group. The next couple of families, we have no Welsh examples. Uh, the Limicodidae, Festoon and Triangle, uh, there's always the outside possibility that they're hiding in some dark um, corner of Wales um, but again county recorder would be really interested get a good photo and um, 
you never know. Kentish glory, I would imagine that's unlikely to be overlooked. It's a fantastic species and it's now pretty much um, confined to Scotland. Um, but I, yeah, again, I suppose, you know, it, it, it's possible. Uh, um, but yeah, that you, you, that's, it's an unmistakable species at least. Another unmistakable species, uh, the only member of the silk moth family uh, native um, to the UK is the emperor moth. Again, not really going to um, mistake it for anything else unless someone's been releasing other silk moths. Uh, the burnets, um, we've got only um, about a, a dozen or so species. Uh, some are really easy, six spot burnet, fairly straightforward, no problem at all. Forester, there's three species. Um, in South Wales, we only really get the one. In North Wales, they get one of the others. So you kind of need to know a bit about where you are uh, and habitats and food plants. Uh, and we're, we're kind of fortunate in um, in the UK that we've only, we haven't, haven't got that many species because in Europe, it's even more horrendously complicated. We've just really got to worry about five spot and narrow bordered five spot down here in South Wales uh, and this actually I, I meant to double check which one that was but it's actually an, an aberration of a five spot burnet or a um, or a six spot I can't remember I'd need to uh, yeah should have should have checked that um, but yeah so in terms of the distinguishing the five spot and the narrow bordered five spot they're really quite tricky in West Wales it's mainly five spot in eastern southeastern Wales it's mainly um, narrow bordered in Glamorgan we get both uh, and actually probably the the larvae are easier to determine because narrow bordered has uh, long hairs um, uh, which um, yeah it can be really helpful for identifying so that's the burnets um, next big family uh, the last year camp is the eggers um, again be a dozen or so species most of which you would just know um, things like drinker fairly straightforward um, these are lackeys uh, December moth is a, a, a pretty distinctive there is some funky um, funkiness going on with um, Okega um, which is you know, Okega versus northern Okega is probably a conversation for another day. Well, it's definitely a conversation for another day. I'm not, not covering them today. Uh, but the others, there's a, most of them are relatively straightforward once you become familiar with them. Um, so, yeah, definitely a group that you certainly you should recognize the group. They're big, furry, chunky things. Um, but, yeah. Sphingids, the Hulk moths, again, you're pretty much gonna know uh, when you catch a hawk moth. They're the, the, the big ones, the pretty ones, um, the striking ones, the ones that all the kids love to see. And, and to be fair, all the adults like to see. I mean, I can't, can't rule out. I, mean, I had an elephant hawk myself this morning and uh, yeah, I was just really pleased to see it. Um, so yeah, not, not a difficult group in theory. Um, although there was a conversation on, um, on Twitter, I, I seem to recall earlier this year where um, Steve Ormrod had posted uh, a picture of a lime hawk and someone suggested, oh, have you, have you definitely ruled out willow herb, willow herb hawk? It's like, well, willow herb hawk isn't generally found in Cardiff. Lime hawk is commonly found in Cardiff. That's a willow herb hawk. And they're not, okay, superficially they're similar, I suppose, but yeah, I think if you're reasonably familiar with lime hawk, you're not going to mistake it for a willow herb hawk. So yeah, it was a bit of a, an odd, an odd suggestion that someone uh, liked to uh, threw in. So, but yeah, in, in South Wales, lime hawk is pretty common and willow herb hawk would be first for Wales. So that would be nice. Uh, the next family is the Notodontidae. Um, these are the prominents um, and most of these species would be um, those that you can just say, yes, that's that species, things like pebble prominent and buff tip and pale prominent. They, once you become familiar with them, once you've caught them a few times, you're not going to mistake them. I would say if you ever um, light trap um, uh, live, if you like, and, uh, and and you see something like a pale prominent come, come to light, you'll think, oh, I'm earth is that because it looks massive and it looks really odd but of course as soon as it sits and folds itself up it's like oh yeah it's a bell prominent i see fair enough um and of course I, i'm 
the kittens I've, I've mentioned kittens already and i thought i understood kittens and could tell them apart but there was a conversation on uh the sobrek facebook page which probably taught me I really can't actually necessarily tell them apart so um, so good luck with kittens is all I'd say on that the next family along is the drapanids um, this includes the hook tips um, as well as um, the, the beautiful um, buff arches and uh, peach blossom fantastic um, species and also the uh, Chinese character really lovely um most of so most of these most of the drapanids uh, are going to be species that you're just going to recognize once you've become familiar with them the only thing that you need to be careful with are the lute strings um these can be um a bit tricky in the sense that when you first catch one you might think that you've caught um, a noctuid because they have the kind of feel of a noctuid to them but once you've recognized what it is about them they, they sort of sit a bit more sort of rolled um, than most noctuids um, they've just got a bit of a, a different sort of a bit of a different vibe to them I guess um, but once you're familiar with them and know where to check then you can quickly rule them out um, the other thing that you need to be aware of is that not all hook tips are trepanids. Um, so this is the beautiful hook tip and it's actually in the Aribidae, not in the Trepanidae. But again, once you've spent half an hour poring over the um, six or seven uh, hook tips and you couldn't find it, and then someone's pointed out, ah, that's because it's actually at the other end of the book. And you've looked at that and you thought, oh yeah, so it is. You don't kind of get caught out that often. Um, you'll get caught out the first couple of times, but after that you'll think, oh yeah, I remember. That's somewhere else. And that's a big, big key when it comes to um, identifying moths. Big family of the geometrids. Um, as I said, there was about... 300 odd species and I would love to take you through all of the various subfamilies uh, but given that we're already pushing 50 odd minutes into this uh, presentation and I've got quite a long way to go um, we're not going to go through all of them I will pick out a few things it again it's the subfamilies really that, that matter so recognizing that you've got a pug or you've got an emerald or you've got a wave or a carpet that's really where it comes down to the trick to, to learning where in the book you're going with of course the caveat that not all emeralds are with the emeralds so this is a light emerald um, there's a whole plate of emeralds and this isn't on it uh, but again when you become familiar with it it's actually easy to pick up it's got this um, little red a pickle streak which none of the other um, emeralds have so if you catch an emerald check the um, the apex of the wing it's got a little red streak that's ah, light emerald know that one if it hasn't got that then you can pull through the books and work out which one of the many emeralds it might be similarly with the waves most of the waves are on one plate but there are a couple um, at the, the other end of the geometers and again one, if you've spent um, a good morning pouring over the, the the dozen or so wave species and you haven't found this moth which is the common marble uh, common white wave if you haven't found it uh, then check at the other end flick through the book oh yeah it's one of these two and in this case it's the common white wave not cream wave or, or one of those uh, so that's the geometers as i say i'm not going to spend too much time on those uh the ariba day right this is where things sort of changed for me so when i was growing up um the arctids were in one family of their own uh the lymantrias were in a family of their own they all kind of got lumped together and um put into this other family with a bunch that I would have considered to be noctuids so it's all a bit sort of confusing and if I get a bit confused about what's in the Ariba Day and what isn't that's why it's because that's different to how I how I grew up and learnt it but so it's a very again a very diverse family uh, it includes the tigers the footmen um, things like vapora and pale tussock in the lion man trees with the love 
love vapor caterpillars, funky. Uh, and then a bunch of species that I would have considered be noctuids. So things like the herald, the red underwing and its similar species, the black neck, um, the snouts and mother Shipton and Burnett companion and, and, and those things. Most of the species in the Ariba Day are going to be, once you've become familiar with them, you just know them. There's things, some that you'll need to check, things like some of the footman species you might have to sort of look at more than once, but the vast majority uh, should be those that you will just get to know. Noctuids. Noctuids are a huge family. Uh, and again, I could probably spend um, a whole day just taking you through the various subfamilies. And I would say that in preparing this talk, it, it um, quickly became apparent to me that this could easily have been a series of talks, and I guess it could still be a series of talks. Um, I'll, I'll check with my agent later as to see whether that's a feasible thing, because we could easily spend a day or, uh, or or at least a good hour talking about just the, the, the darts or just the pugs if we went back to the um, geometers and I'm sure that that would be a very popular and a well subscribed um, talk if it did happen. Uh, so with the noctuids um, there's a few sort of morphological things that are worth sort of uh, picking out in terms of recognizing your subfamily so the, the, the darts um, uh, and things like ingrailed clay and, uh, and and the other clays, they tend to sit flat with their wings um, flat across their body. Things like the hadonines, which um, the, this L. album wainscot and um, small ronculus, they have hairy eyes, and I'll come back to the hairy eyes in a bit. Um, and the plusiids, the, the, the uh, things like the silver wire and the burnished brass and such like have this really sort of funky um, thorax and really sort of intricate and often uh, metallic wings. But the, the noctuids are a big group. As I say, I could spend quite a lot of time just on those. So the final family um, of uh, macros are the nolidae. And I think this is where you'd have to look at it and think, oh, hang on a minute, Phil. Um, not sure that your uh, definition of macro versus micro holds up because all of the nolidae are about, um, they're not, they haven't got a wingspan of more than a, uh, more than a cent, uh, more than a couple of centimeters. So you could probably say that they are more micro than most of the pyrrolids. So I'm not sure whether that holds up. But anyway, they're, 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 they're macros. So let's, let's not, worry too much about the definition. We only have three species in Wales uh, with the Kent black arches only arriving in the last couple of years. Um, short cloak moth and, and um, least black arches being uh, relatively widespread. Um, so those are the families and uh, so I've been talking for an hour. Uh, we'll have a five minute intermission. Uh, so if you want to take um, yeah, quick break, uh, nip the loo, grab a coffee, and I'll see you back here in a few minutes. Okay. Dave. Hello. Hello. Did you see the message, the question from Mike Westford in the chat? Uh, about iNaturalist? Yes. Did you cover it? i not actually covering recording, no. Um, okay. Um, but, just to say that we're going to, we don't encourage the use of our naturalists at the moment because it is not compatible with our um, database. So if you're putting data onto iNaturalist, it's probably not getting used in the same way as it would if you're using iRecord. I've got a feeling that they've changed the way that it link. I've got a feeling it is now linking more directly with iRecord because I'm certainly seeing um, Frank, I can't remember his surname. Um, I'm seeing his records when I'm verifying quite regularly and I don't think it's just because I haven't got around to verifying his records yet. So, um, but yeah, so fair, fair enough. Um, I see, so it helps with the identifying. Yeah. yeah, so it's kind of more like sort of the iSpot kind of um, route. Yeah. I'd say that it, it... Is that five minutes, Elaine? <laughs> 
Um, I don't know. Um, as far as identification from um, iNaturalist is concerned, it, it is useful, um, but I think kind of be aware that it's an American program, so it will default to American species in some cases. Um, so just bear that in mind if you're using it for identification. Um, I don't know if you mentioned what's flying tonight, Dave. Listen. No, again, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with the taxonomy, not, uh, okay. so no, uh, um, it's quite a useful one, yeah. Yeah, so if you're kind of a newcomer to moths or certainly at the start of a new season and you've kind of forgotten everything that you get in the summer, um, there's a, a, a website called What's Flying Tonight where you put in your postcode or, or your location information and it tells you the most top 100 moths that are recorded in that area. In your 10k square so it's quite a useful um, starting point for the commoner ones that are around a particular time of year um, that's probably is five minutes now dave so yeah I, I will just add to that I, it, one of the things that i want to add to the glamorgan moth group uh, website and indeed to um Adarian when when john's got some time is some more sort of usable sort of um analytics like that so that it can be more interrogated and give out what's found at certain times because uh, the data is there so it shouldn't be that difficult to incorporate but i haven't done it yet and i'll get around to it at some point right, and and just before i close the chat and, and get back on um in answer to mark's question uh about um vestigial forelimbs i don't know i don't think they do um i think that's something specific to some of the butterflies um but yeah i'm uh, i'm not entirely sure but it's distinctly possible right um assuming everyone is there i can't see everybody so i've got no idea whether everybody's there or not so i'm just going to crack on hope that's okay uh right so gone through the families how do you actually go about identifying some things and there there are quite a few um, useful tips um, and the posture is is the one thing that was severely lacking um, when I was growing up and learning these uh, things so you know for example I would hate to imagine how much time um, as a family we wasted trying to turn one of these early thorns because we used to catch quite a lot of early thorns uh, back home in Somerset um, the time we spent trying to say oh well hang on a minute that one looks a bit darker it's a bit more purplish on the house that, surely that's a good candidate for a purple thorn isn't it and then um, after a, uh, I don't know we'd been trapping probably for 10 years uh i found a purple thorn sitting in a in the tree next to the moth trap and it's like oh that's a purple thorn you just know straight away because it doesn't sit anything like early thorn you are not going to mistake it if it's at rest it's as simple as that you did and i can't actually remember i uh, i don't have a copy of um, south's volume two um to, to see whether he actually includes in that oh and by the way purple thorn sits with its wings cup shaped and early thorn never does um, but if he if he did say that then i apologize mr south because uh, we completely skipped over that over the years and completely ignored it you don't get that information um from skinner you don't get that information from the moths and butterflies of great britain and ireland because they're set specimens and i fully accept that that is a flaw in the books that um i used growing up that you don't have that problem anymore um as um the new generation the internet internet generation of, of, of mothers the digital digital age uh because there's photos and, and all that sort of information out there that makes it so much easier so yeah posture is a huge um a, a huge thing uh when it comes to identifying things uh now markings obviously uh the thing that really sort of um helps distinguish uh moths will be the the markings on the wings and um for that you you're, you're essentially comparing like with like um so for example 
and uh, here is a willow beauty uh, and um, the other common species is the mottled beauty uh, both um, sit remarkably similarly um, both common both will turn up in any moth trap uh, pretty much anywhere certainly uh, in the southern half of the UK and I can't imagine that they tail off that much when, they, when we get up into uh, into Scotland um, and how do you tell them apart well the uh, the key difference uh, really is in the uh, the markings uh, of the of the uh, the post median line and the median line so in willow beauty you kind of almost get this sort of y shaped and in mottle beauty it's kind of a uh, a w shaped and that really is the sort of the key difference between willow beauty and mottle beauty and there's quite if you if you google uh, willow beauty versus model beauty there's quite a lot of uh, useful information and, an, and another fantastic um, website out there that has lots of uh, useful guides uh, is for example this one um, eekring birds uh, um, which has a really useful guide um, to what the key differences are between willow beauty and mottle beauty. It does include these other species. Uh, I was intrigued that they don't have satin beauty on, on here, but yeah, but great oak beauty and pale oak beauty. You think you've caught those in Wales, get a photo and let us have it because there are no confirmed records of either of those, at least as far as Glamorgan are concerned, possibly in the Wye Valley, um, you might be getting it. Uh, those two species, but we don't get them in Glamorgan, um, to my knowledge, despite people keep sending me records of them. Um, so you never know, but most of them tend to be satin beauty because that's got a really big female. But I've digressed. Uh, the difference mainly between mottled beauty and willow beauty is really nicely sort of illustrated um, on this uh, web page. And things that I uh, had probably learnt in the past but completely forgotten about so things like the shape of the antennae is different between the two species and the um, the way that the, uh, the the terminal line um, works uh, between the two species so there's much more sort of uh, much more scalloped uh, in the willow beauty uh, yeah much more scalloped in mottled beauty and the antennae are less feathered uh, in mottled than willow so yeah, useful information out there that will help you sort of distinguish species based on markings. Uh, and as I say, I'm not gonna, I, I could do another hour going through each of the different species pairs or groups, but just to really sort of give you an idea as to what you'd be looking for. Uh, the other thing um, that it's worth noting when, when looking at wing markings is uh, confusion uh, can be brought in. So, for example, here we have a brimstone moth. That's uh, fairly sort of standard, um, common British moth should be found anywhere. But then you get something like this. And again, I apologize to whoever took this photo and sent it to me. I can't actually remember, but you've got this odd variation where the, the where the uh, the chestnut marking has, has spread all the way up the wing. Now it's clearly still a brimstone moth because um, there isn't really anything else that, that looks like that. All the markings are there um, in the same place. Um, you know, the, 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 the discal spot is, is, is still there. It still has that mark. It's just that it's sort of bled out and there's just more, more of it. So it is still, but it's very easy when you're starting out looking at moths to get sort of um, drawn into the pitfall. Well, it doesn't match the picture, therefore it must be something else. Try not to worry too much. It, it, it's more about the general impression, I suppose, than the precision. And I mean, when you get something like this um, turn up, you think, what on earth is that? It looks fantastic looking thing. Um, and it, you know, it, it threw us. Um, I think Jake caught this one, Jay, uh, uh, Dave Gilmore. And um, 
but it is it is a ribbon wave and you can make out uh just about the the two lines that make up the median fascia and the discal spots and the shape and everything else is spot on for ribbon wave it's just this um aberration uh where it's it's dusted in in, in these dark scales uh, the other thing um, that is worth taking into account is uh, is colour, because colour is a fickle thing, or it can be. So if you caught that, um, now to me, immediately I know what it is, but if you were looking through the books, you might not find it, because, um, well, it's it, it should be that colour. Uh, and, and green is, is notorious for fading to yellow. So if you've got uh, a yellow moth and you can't find it, just imagine it as being green. Or a, a, a useful um, technique that um, a fellow county recorder from Hertfordshire, um, Colin Plant, uh, has always suggested is, if you take your photo and take the colour out and then try and identify it, because from that, it's a lot clearer that the markings um correspond between these two individuals much much more closely than the, than the color ever would so just consider having a look at your photo and taking the color out and seeing whether that if you can't find it seeing whether that helps um get you to where you need to be hairy eyes i love banging on about hairy eyes and, and um it's a, a character that is oft overlooked. So there's only one subfamily of um, of noctuids that have the hairy eyes. But if you if you caught something like this, uh, it's one of the brocades. Uh, which one is it? Uh, well, you can instantly rule out uh, dusky brocade, which is probably the the commonest of um, of the brocades if you look at it with a hand lens and you look across the surface of the eye and you see that it's got hairs all the way across the surface of the eye it's the only um so yeah so the, the, that subfamily which includes the um the orthosias the, the 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 spring quakers um the uh the wainscots, uh, or half the wainscots, should I say, the, 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 the Haddonine wainscots, and then these uh, brocades, things like dot moth, cabbage moth, bright light brown eye, these are all in, in the Haddonine, and they all have hairy eyes. Really useful, uh, just, as I say, hand lens, hold it up to the light, and you should see uh, these hairy eyes. Uh, also um, less obvious and probably less necessary but when I talk about hairy eyes it's also uh, I love the idea of, of um, the the coculina which have these eyelashes um, which you can see so um, that's the subfamily that includes the sharks and um, things like uh, red line quaker yellow line quaker um, and um, early grey and a few others they have these 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 fabulous um, eyelashes uh, which uh, yeah it's just great uh, so again getting to know the groups within the noctuid is really the kind of um, the, the the key message that I keep banging on about right let's do a bit of um, case studies shall we <laughs> So about a week or so ago, uh, this moth, there's a picture missing. Oh, well, never mind. Uh, this moth on the right um, was uh, posted on the Sobrek um, uh, forum uh, on Facebook page. And uh, so Mike Cram uh, posted it saying that um, he thought maybe it might be bordered straw um, he's had they've had eastern bordered straw and scarce built bordered straw at their garden but he didn't it didn't quite fit so he wanted to um, he just wanted to run it run it past people and see what they thought and as I say so he, he thought bordered straw uh, 
and I think someone suggested ingrailed clay. Now I looked at it and I thought, well, it's an ingrailed clay. End of, end of story, that, that, that just is. And I thought, well, again, because I was preparing this talk, I thought, well, okay, I've made a brash statement that I know exactly what it is without really thinking. Can I, can I sit down and justify why it's an ingrailed clay and not uh, say, for example, a boarded straw? So this is a boarded straw. This is an ingrailed clay. Or this is this, sorry. This is the moth that I am going to hopefully prove to you is an ingrailed clay. Uh, so what can I see? Um, well, it's uh, my notes aren't on this page. That's annoying. So um, there's a few things. Uh, maybe it's because I haven't got there. The other thing that they yeah. So that's bordered straw. They also suggested that it might possibly uh, eastern bordered no scarce bordered straw. And I'm going to go back. So um, there's a few things. So the shape of the kidney mark. You can't really see the kidney mark very clearly. Uh, but this is a dark kidney mark. That's a pale kidney mark. The subapical spots uh, is a bit different. The subterminal line is similar. Um, yeah, it's, and it's got a, a spot here, and it's got a spot there. They are similar. I'll, I'll, I'll certainly give them that. They are similar, but the, the wing shape looks a bit sort of off. Um, yeah, and it just didn't really feel quite right. This is scarce boarded straw, and this is sitting more like you'd expect one of the boarded straws to sit. So it's a bit more tentiform, um, so a bit more sort of angled. Uh, but this again, it just doesn't really feel right. The um, much more reticulated sort of wings with these sort of scalloping marks. Okay, it should be pointed out, there are quite a few scales missing from this moth. It is a bit worn. Uh, you can see this is the edge of the wing and it's got no terminal cilia at all. So these are the terminal cilia, these, these hairs that come off the edge of the wing. The fact that this has got none indicates it's been around a block it, it's it's been around a while it's 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 a bit bashed about so yeah take take into account there are some scales missing here but it just doesn't really it still it doesn't really fit properly whereas that's an ingrailed clay photo and you look at that and you think well it looks nothing like it what, what, you, what are you talking about Dave it's just just complete nonsense the color is completely different but Bear with me. The problem with ingrailed clay, it's one of those species that you just have to get to familiar with to rule out because it is an exceptionally variable species. It has a, quite a few colour morphs. So this, things like this and uh, square spot rustic and a few others, these are the ones that you want to rule out. Uh, let's just do the trick of taking the colour out. And now if we look at it, uh, okay, the first thing now that I've taken the color out that comes uh, immediately, okay, so the dot is a little bit smaller, but again, you'd expect, but it's in the right place. Uh, the reniform stigma is, um, is this sort of peculiar sort of squared off end and a little bit sort of, yeah, it's pretty much the same sort of shape as that. Okay, there's no, no sign of the orbicular stigma at all. Uh, but the but the key thing that I, I take from this photo is if you look at the slightly sort of darker section. So from here we've got the we've got a pale bit. So that's the the, the subterminal um, area, and then all the way up to this all of this area is kind of darker, and that corresponds to the mystery moth here. Uh, pretty much the same shape as well. So you you get this sort of uh, tick shape which this, this moth also has. So I don't know whether that's uh, conclusive uh, enough for, for people, but to me, that's, I was happy that that, that justified my uh, determination. Also probably worth the, along the, along the terminum, uh, these uh, little triangular dots also correspond quite neatly. So it's lost the terminal cilia, which is the, this hair here. So that's the actual edge of the wing and that corresponds to the edge of the wing there. And the shape and the posture, yeah, that's, I was quite happy that I justified it to myself anyway. 
So yeah, so there we go. That is, in my opinion, an Ingrail clay. And I think that was the photo that should have been at the beginning of that section rather than at the end. But there we go, never mind. Um, right, we're we are nearly there, I think. Uh, I'm now gonna talk about an extreme mystery. So this uh, photo um, was sent to me by uh, local recorder Howard. Um, He'd entered it into uh, our website, so record as a southern wainscot. No, no, sorry, common wainscot. And common wainscot is one of those species that is a bit of a red flag for me because um, it's well, it's not common for a star. It's actually uh, remarkably uncommon. And there was a, uh, a period uh, where I was convinced that it had actually uh, been lost from Glamorgan. So um, I was pushing people, if you caught a common wainscot, to please send me a photo because, um, per, partly because I don't believe anybody's catching common wainscot. I think that the people are mistaking them uh, for smoky wainscot. Um, and yeah, so I, I went on a bit of a campaign to try and get people to um, prove that they were actually catching common wainscots. Unfortunately, people were able to prove that common wainscot is still found in Glamorgan. Uh, but I looked at that and I thought, well, that's, that's not common wainscot. That's not a wainscot. I don't know what that is. And it's quite, it, it's remarkably easy to point out to someone when they've got an identification wrong. That's, that's the easy bit. Getting to a point where you can convince them what it actually is is a little bit more tricky. So I can say straight away, yeah, that's not, that's not a common wainscot, but I have no idea what it is. Um, just looked odd, it, it, it didn't look right. So that was for the upper side. He, he photographed, because it was dead, he photographed it from both uh, angles and the weird genitalia stuff going on here, strongly pectinate antennae. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of clues um, that, I thought, well, actually, I reckon I've, I, I've got a shout. I, I reckon we might be able to get, get a bit closer than, than uh, it's an unknown noctuid. So this is a smoky wainscot. It's not a common wainscot. But as I said, I, I, there was a period at that time where I didn't think anybody was catching common wainscots anyway. So I was quite happy to substitute a smoky wainscot in, uh, in this talk. Uh, the antennae are pretty much smooth. There's no real sort of indication of pectination. Um, it, yeah, compare, compare them side by side and they don't really look that similar to me. Um, certainly, you know, the pectination, the, the general color as well. It, 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 even though there are probably only a dozen scales on the whole moth, um, it just doesn't have the feel of um, of being a sort of a straw coloured moth. It's a, it's a, it's a, a dark brown sort of moth. Uh, so then um, if we look at the antennae, so here, yes, and smooth, not much, not much going on. These are strongly pectinate. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that that's not uh, a wainscot. There's also the suggestion that it's got a basal line here. Uh, which you don't get on wainscots. Uh, I mean, there aren't many scales. You know, I, I, I fully accept there are not many scales on that moth. But what you've got, don't scream uh, wainscot to me. So let's let's have a look again at this moth. Now, at this point, actually, um, my familiarity with Merrick came in quite handy. So, as I mentioned before, Merrick does almost all of its um, identification based on wing venation and given the venation is something we can actually see here uh, I thought well this 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 must be useful the other thing that came to mind when, when looking at that moth was it reminded me an awful lot of puss moth because you can see these these dark brown veins come poking through the markings and I thought well maybe that's that's where I should start um, and it quickly became obvious that it wasn't um, a, uh, a puss moth, but equally it became blatantly obvious that it was nothing like the venation that you'd get on uh, on the smoky wainscot. Completely, completely wrong. There's there's, there's no uh, indication that you get these sort of these ridges between the veins. 
it's just yeah it's just it's so definitely not smoky wainscot or common wainscot but it doesn't really fit um puss moth either so uh okay so let's let's take it as um let's look at the venation yeah okay the venation seems to work what else have we got merrick looked at in its um in the keys it's a key driven book because you don't have pictures to work from it talked about um a couplet where you have this uh, to do with the um, the length of the spurs on the hind leg on the hind leg and you know really fortunate that um that howard took this photo from the underside because actually from that we actually get to the point so this is the hind tibia the, the length of, of that uh, is um on the number of spurs on that was uh got me down to the genus uh, drymonia which is either marbled brown or lunar marbled brown well, there you go that's sort of uh yeah picking out the spurs so the couplet was uh, posterior tibia without a middle spur or with middle spur well it's got a middle spur so that gives you drymonia uh, so we think we have a, a lunar marbled brown and if you sort of look at the markings as i say such as they are uh, does have the basal uh, streak okay it's, it's covered in sort of fur here from the from the furry abdomen uh, it's got strongly pectinate antennae, which fits my moth, or Howard's moth rather, and the venation kind of fits as well. So you can see the veins sticking out through um, through the through the uh, through the scales underneath. So I was able to turn around to Howard. That moth with no scales is a lunar marbled brown, and he was most grateful. Um, <clears throat> So <clears throat> we are drawing to a close. Uh, the key things to take really when you're identifying moths is to look at the shapes, look at the posture. Don't get too bogged down on the, in the minutiae of, um, of where the markings are. Definitely ignore colour. Um, <laughs> colour can, can take you down the wrong path, um, at least up to a point check uh within the books look for the similar species see what they suggest uh you could be confusing it with and then double check that the characters you can see on the moth that you are looking at are uh, uh, correspond make sure that the species that you're looking at is actually known and recognized as being from your location if it's not then make sure you get a decent photo and pass it on to your county recorder um, but the key message, hopefully I've been banging on, is, is, is getting to know the groups. Recognise that you've got a noctuid. Recognise that you've got um, a group within the noctuids. Look for those hairy eyes. I challenge you to look for hairy eyes. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that is pretty much it. Uh, I'll thank everybody whose photo I've nicked from the Glamorgan Moth Group archive and uh, didn't properly credit i know that there are photos in there from paul parsons from bill jones uh from chris manley uh paul parsons yeah there's there's quite a few people in there um for whom i'm uh, grateful for using their photos and that is that so uh no wrong way let's go to that let's go to that and let's go to stop share and let's get back to the traditional Zoom. So let's have a look what's happening in the chat. Uh, bom, bom, bom. So, how do we get to? Uh, so I dealt with Mark's question about vestigial limbs. Yep, definitely check the eyes. Uh, does the posture of the wings when closed 
have any relevance no left uh, um, no left and right handedness I don't think um, is uh, an issue for moths um, you can persuade a moth to, to switch sides quite quite happy um, do, 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 do a good resource to identify specialist generalist species or north south so um, well I think in in terms of um, the general stuff, I think the, the the books that we've already mentioned, the Waring Townsend and Lewington um, and Skinner, will give you the most sort of generalist information. Um, in terms of the sort of the north south divide thing, uh, you you kind of need to look at the various sort of local moth groups to find out if it's um, specifically in a particular area. If you're in Wales, then obviously um, a Derin uh, will give you a good idea as to whether the species you're looking at is found. Um, but in terms of a sort of a, a general thing, th there's various, moth groups have various websites across the whole of the UK and they all have little, little snippets of information. Um, one of the sort of the long-term aims for a Darien is to have species accounts as well as just the distribution maps available so you click through and, and it will tell you whether it's found you know within the whole of the UK or whether it's only in the southern UK and, and various other bits and pieces but that's uh, there's quite a long way off before a Darien is capable of doing that. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, Phil Smith says, um, do we ever get migrant moths from mainland Europe or is their flight too weak? No, absolutely we do. Um, yeah, one, quite regularly. In fact, um, the, the, the strength, it's, it's amazing how far these things go. The, the diamondback moth, which is a micro, tiny little thing, um, can come across in huge numbers. Um, and it's, it's got a wingspan of what? couple of centimeters at most 15 millimeters maybe a tiny little moth so no um not really a, not really a barrier at all they are in fact there's a whole websites and twitter accounts that you can follow which will tell you when the weather conditions are um particularly favorable for uh, migrants um because if you get a uh, a nice strong southerly flow from uh, from north africa then people across um southern england and and will be getting their traps out and, and hauling in um as many sort of migrant things as you can i mean i caught a silver wire a couple of days ago they're generally migrants they will breed when they get here um as with most you know most of those things but yeah the no, migrant moths have no no problem getting over here at all uh, bom, bom, bom. Um, some, uh, Bethan asks, um, she's interested in doing moth trapping in her garden, but she doesn't have much vegetation, um, but it is near Hammer Drive Park, so is it worth a go? I'd say it's yep. always worth a go. It's always worth a go. Um, yeah, uh, you, you will catch moths um, regard, from, from a wide area. Um, and yeah, you'll be, you'll be pulling in stuff from the park. Um, my former garden in um in uh where did i used to live lanishan in cardiff um <laughs> was on the northern edge of cardiff and i didn't tend to get very migrant very many migrants in my moth trap because they had to get across the whole of cardiff but i would pull stuff down from the mountains um so yeah you'll 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 get stuff anywhere um no matter how rubbish the actual garden itself is you, you will definitely catch moths um, and yes, what's flying tonight is the website that I mentioned that somebody's put it in the chat now, the link to it. So cool. Uh, recommend that. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question verbally, you can unmute yourself and, and go for it if you want. Just don't all do it at once. Yeah. Um, yeah, Irene. I'm a complete beginner and I just wanted a bit of advice regarding I'd like to get a, a moth trap, but not spend a phenomenal amount of money. I just wondered about advice on the best way to start. How, how handy are you? Um, um, and I realised I could knock a few bits up <laughs> and have a, a white sheet. Or well, something. my mum, my mum uh, has made most of the moth traps my parents use, um, and it's basically a box um, with a light on it. 
I'm just bear with me for a second because somewhere here um, I should have a moth trap yeah here we go uh, right can you see that so that is a, um, a laundry basket pop-up laundry basket I've lost the picture oh typical I'm using a phone and <laughs> right oh, golly, so uh, well for those who can see uh, it's a laundry basket um, 10 pounds probably or five pounds from M&S or Tesco uh, really cheap um, and that's all you that's all you need um, for a moth trap and then you just need a light source and for a light source then um, you could use a lampshade and an old any any old bulb in a in a lampshade sort of so if you invert the lampshade and stick it upside down in the uh, in your uh, laundry basket then you will attract moths it's as simple as that it's as simple as that a box with a light is all you need and you put sort of egg boxes in the bo bottom don't you or yeah so you use egg boxes um, to sort of give the moths somewhere to settle um, and um, allow them to sort of um, to chill out basically until the morning uh, and then in the morning you go in and, and, and see what's there um, it, I would say you know with something like the laundry basket because it's sort of uh, open to the elements um, you want to really be um, looking at the contents relatively early uh, which you know or you know soon as soon after it gets light as you can because it and it doesn't retain the, the the catch particularly well unlike some of the you know the, the, the posh expensive moth traps but you will catch moths there's no doubt about it um, it's it's done me quite well uh, that, that little thing could you i've got the picture now could you just hold that up again to show yeah. me <laughs> so um it's a as i say it's a pop-up um laundry basket oh brilliant that i see i see yeah, I've got the idea. The, yeah. but the the idea would being with the with the circular sort of bit at the top um for for where you would put the um the upside down lampshade and that, that will work or you can put the you can actually put the light inside the trap um oh. and and it will work just as well um but yeah, any any bulb, any light source, um, and you will catch some moths. Different lights. Do Sorry, carry Do you put anything in for them to feed on? No, don't don't tend to worry about that. Um, put together later. Uh, no, don't 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 worry too much about that. They um, are fairly sensible in terms of. Um, yeah, no, they, they'll, they'll if they, if they're hungry, they'll go for a nectar source before they go being distracted by lights. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, somebody suggested um, watching the Barry Stewart mothing event to get a, an introduction to moth traps. And um, so I've just posted a link to that in the chat if anybody didn't see that. Um, it was a live event for Wales Nature Week, but it's on YouTube now. Barry uh, Stewart. Yes. Um, yeah, if you can see the chat, um, then there's a link there. I'm not sure if you can see the chat on a phone. But um, we'll send out an email to everybody with a few links of what we've mentioned during the, the course um, after we finish. Um, Dave Carrington says, what are your thoughts on Moth ID UK on Twitter? Send him a picture and he'll ID it for you. Send him um, a donation if you like. <laughs> I'm sure he's fine. I think I don't actually know who runs that particular website, uh, that, that particular Twitter uh, account. Um, as with all um, people who claim to know uh, all IDs, people will make mistakes. I made plenty of mistakes in my time, um, published such things. So uh, just take IDs with a pinch of salt, uh, but I'm sure he's fine. Um, as I say, I don't, I don't actually know uh, who that is, so I can't actually vet him based on uh, personal experience. I'm sure he's fine, I'm sure he's fine. I say he. I, 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 was very remiss of me. It could have, could be anybody. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, and Daniel Jenkins Jones says, in suitable weather, should you run your trap every night, or is that too much stress on the local population? Should they give? Should you give them a few nights off? Well, I think it's more per, uh, a stress on, um, on 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 you as the recorder, particularly if you're getting up at dawn to to do it. I I find it. Very difficult to do that in the height of the summer. Um, in terms of how much stress it's putting on the population, I don't know. Whenever I've heard um, research about mark and recapture 
um, experiments, they've tended to imply that if you release your moths um, suitably uh, distant from the trap, that actually very few will re-enter the trap. So you're probably not actually doing that much um, that much harm to the population from that. What I would say is that the more regularly the tra you trap, the more um, your resident bird population will get familiar with the idea. And I regularly have to try and beat the sparrows um, in my garden. Uh, they've almost always taken everything from from around the trap before I get up. So I try to sort of not do it every day for, for that reason as much as anything else, just to sort of give them, keep them on their toes so they're not immediately just taking everything. Uh, um, yeah, but again, back in my old um, garden in, in, in Anishin, um I did have half a dozen baby house sparrows in my Skinner trap, which was very um well it, it was carnage i think it's fair to say there was sort of moth bits absolutely everywhere and, and they looked a bit startled when i came and let them out so that was something at least but yeah so that's more the concern i i don't think i don't know how much it affects populations per se running a moth trap but for your own sanity as much as anything else i would say um yeah don't don't do it every day just you know when unless the weather is particularly suitable or there's a particular southern plume of, of air coming up from the Sahara in which case yeah get your trap on because you never know what you might get. Uh, Tara says UK moths on Twitter is Sean Foote. Sean Foote. Don't know that name. No, don't know that name. no. but um, as I say I'm sure I'm sure they're very capable. Mark Butler says are there any recommended books um, for the more background information like the phenology um, uh, taxonomy, etc. Uh, yeah, probably. Um, the uh, where is it? Phylo, 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 I'm saying that uh, word wrong. Phylogi, phylogeny. Phylogeny. How do they get their names uh, and, and stuff like that? Yeah, well, the one, for, the one for the names is. Hang on, I'm going to probably break my computer here doing this. <laughs> oh, no, I can reach. So, um, in terms of names, uh, Maitland Emmett, uh, can you see that? Oh, it's backwards. No, it's is that right backwards for us. No, it's uh, is it? Okay, right. Scientific Names of British Lepidoptera by Maitland Emmett. Uh, fantastic gentleman. Um, sadly, uh, no longer with us. Um, but yeah, he goes through all of the British. Um, the entire British list as it was back when he wrote that in the mid 90s uh, and explains what the scientific names mean and uh, uh, it's really really interesting. Uh, uh, bomb, bomb. What was He's his name again Dave? Can you repeat the name of the book or the uh, name of the uh, author? Maitland Emmett. A. Maitland Emmett. Uh, uh, da, da, da. A. Maitland Emmett. Cool. Scientific names of the British Lepidoptera. And, um, Paul Seligman recommends Emperors, Admirals and Chimney Sweepers, the new one by Peter Marin. That's in the chat. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, Zoe Richards says, what's the best weather to put out the trap? Always a good question. Uh, warm, dry, um, overcast, thunder, thundery actually is, yeah. is um, if, if there's a good chance of a thunderstorm, then there's a great night for mothing because it's really humid sticky um yeah th th those are the best nights in winter you you immediately think that you're better off putting it out when it's dry but dry usually means clear and clear usually means cold so it's better to be warm and um and uh misty and sort of drizzly um particularly in, in you know in the, in the winter months rather than clear and crisp and, and blooming cold so yeah the, the wind is problematic um, as much because very much when it's windy um, but also because if you, they quite often miss the trap um, so you know that so yeah avoid high strong winds um, and avoid very cold weather otherwise pretty much any time you will catch something 
Um, they don't, they're not so bothered about rain. Rain doesn't really bother them that much, but obviously if it's heavy rain and you're running a mercury vapor lamp, something that's bright and hot, then um, do take care because um, bright hot bulbs will go pop in um, in heavy rain. Uh, and that's not good, particularly since you can't buy mercury vapor bulbs very easily anymore because they're banned by um, European legislation. Uh, I don't think that's, uh, that's one thing that almost certainly isn't going to be uh, overruled uh, when we finally get Brexit sorted. Um, yeah, Paul's just asking about the safety of the electricity if there's rain on homemade traps, probably not a homemade trap situation if it's wet. Uh, yeah, unless you're really good at and, and, and understand your electrics, I would be very careful. I certainly wouldn't be recommending that. Um, that said, as I say, my parents have been running homemade traps uh, for many, many years and uh, they haven't electrocuted themselves yet that I know of. Um, but what we, what my parents tend to do is they, they make the box and then buy the electrics. So um, that's generally what I would suggest. Uh, I don't know, Mark um has, has made a few traps as well so um he you know he, yeah make, making traps is, is is fairly straightforward making the electrics is is the complicated bit and i would be careful uh, in rain <laughs> i think it's fair to say uh, uh, mark's just suggested putting a water bottle over the bulb to to yeah propane protection um matt brown says um full moon's bad for moths he had only three species when it was clear the other night. I'd say that the moon is very distracting. Yeah, I mean the the whole this is, this is a question I I I always duck if I can avoid it is why are moths attracted to light? Um, and but there's no doubt that during a full moon, um, your moth trap is competing with uh, with the moon. So um, yeah, it, it's. You will still catch stuff, but you will certainly catch less stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely makes it makes it makes an effect. Yeah, not really sure, we, but we don't really know why. We don't really know why moths are attracted to light in the first place. So um, I'm not going to go there. If anyone's going to about to ask me that, <laughs> just grateful that they are because it takes yeah. all the effort out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, some, uh, Richard's just suggested a pyrex bowl as well to cover the bulb. Yeah, that's certainly the traditional way of doing it, yeah. Um, I think we're out of questions on the chat. Has anybody got any more they would like to ask verbally? Oh, hang on. Oh. Irene's got her hand up. Is, is, oh. that, is that deliberate or...? Oh, no, you've just pressed the wrong button. That's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, um, I've got a book that I've got that's um, how to build your own sort of make your own do-it-yourself moth trap, but I just can't seem to find it. But if I can find it, I'll, 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 I'll write it in the chat. Yeah, jolly good. Thank you, Mark. I think that if everybody's happy... Oh, a is useful, Andrew Bevan says. Uh, yes, um, they certainly are. I mean, the, the clear wing recording has been revolutionised by um, pheromone lures. Uh, if you if you happen to have a copy of uh, the Moss of Glamorgan to hand um, and, you, and you looked at the, uh, uh, the clearwing section in there, you, you'll see that basically clearwings weren't recorded um, uh, after about the 1930s because people lost the sort of the field craft as, as to how you, you come across them. Uh, and then uh, pheromone lures um, became available and suddenly clear wings are everywhere and um yeah it's completely revolutionized it current clear wing hadn't been recorded in cardiff since you know from um since 1936 i think it was and then mike power went around all the allotments in cardiff and found it in every single one so yeah lures are amazing um when they work i mean i've had terrible luck with pheromone lures over the years and those partly presumably down to the fact that the, the, the weather's been um, rubbish whenever I've gone out but this year I did finally get success and got orange-tailed um, clearwing from uh, just down just down the road here uh, which is really nice um, didn't see another clearing then for the rest of the day we, we had that one within five minutes of, of setting out and we thought oh, this is easy and then we didn't see anything else so um, not easy 
but yeah, it revolutionised it. And I think Elaine, you had um, success with Emperor Moth as well, didn't you? Yeah, so that had been not been recorded in this square for a, I think there was two records from fifty years ago, but I got it almost immediately when I put it out in the garden. So it is very weather dependent allure. It's got to be hot, kind of windy. Yeah. Get the smell around. And I mean, and with and with, obviously day flying. Yeah. There for day flying. Moth. I mean, they've got, there are also lures for things like coddling moth and, and stuff like that, which you, know, you don't really need to be attracting coddling moth into your garden because if, you know, if you catch it at the light trap, you, you'll, you'll catch it. But they're not designed, they're not, they're not, you know, sold for us. They're sold for people who want to stop them from um, destroying their apple crops, which is fair enough, I suppose. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they, 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 they'd also work. <laughs> it's also... Uh, Clear wings are, are, are fickle creatures as well, so in theory they all fly at slightly different times of, of day, um, as well as being at slightly different times of um, the year. And, and yeah, so it's it's they're, they're quite complicated, but but they are good fun. Good fun. My brother's got. I'm, I'm quite jealous. He's got a um, lunar hornet um, lure, and he's going out in the next couple of days when the weather cheers up, and I'm sure they'll get them out in, on the the sand dunes at Barrow because they must be everywhere out there. There's so much willow. Cool. Um, I think that we're done then, if everybody's happy. Um, so I'll send an email around after this with just some links to the stuff that we've discussed. Um, and I found it. I've, I've, at least I found it on my order history. I haven't found the actual book, unfortunately. Um, it's called How to Build Your Own Moth Trap, Step-by-Strap Instructions, How to Build a Low-Cost Moth Trap. Um, it's like, um, I think it was funded by the Field Studies Council or something like that. Um, but it's by Paul J. Palmer. It should be. I'll, I'll, type it, I'll type it out. Yeah, if you pop it in the chat and then I'll gather all the info we've popped in the chat and put it into an email just for everybody's information. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you to everybody for attending. We'll probably see quite a few on the micro course next week, um, which has got about one space left on it. So, yeah, if you haven't booked, then get on it. <laughs> Um, yeah, you happy, Dave? That's a bit more hardcore. Yeah, that is. <laughs> the keen beans. Yeah. Okie okay. dokie. Well, thank, thank you very, very much, everybody. Farewell. Uh, well, see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>